This concrete Soviet facade may look imposing, but it's no match for the frigid Ukrainian winters. As the temperature drops below freezing, water that has accumulated in cracks expands, exerting bursting pressure that pulls apart the masonry. As vegetation grows unchecked, the roots spread through foundations and stairs. These roots suck in moisture that makes them expand and grow. Like miniature hydraulic jacks, over time they slowly push apart the concrete. This is only 20 years. Can you imagine what this facility will look like after 200 years? After the accident, scientists expected the worst for the wildlife in the region. Most of the trees in a one and a half square mile area around the nuclear plant were killed off by radiation. Many animals died. But incredibly, the effect of the absence of humans for 20 years has outweighed the initial damage caused by the nuclear nightmare. This is the Red Forest, an area that was horribly impacted by, uh, by radioactivity due to the Chernobyl explosion. And the trees that you see around me were, were killed by the radioactivity. The original amounts of radioactivity were sufficient to kill all of the wildlife in the region as well. But now we see a resurgence of the wildlife. As an example of how wildlife has prospered here, uh, uh, we see here we have a, an antler from a red deer, and obviously a fairly large and healthy red deer. Red deer are hardly found in any other areas in this region, and the Chernobyl zone is the only place that you'll find uh, uh, populations of red deer. We also find Russian wild boar that the populations in the zone are 10 to 15 times higher than they are outside of the zone. We're now at the kindergarten of Karpachi village, not far from the Chernobyl station. Children were living here while their parents worked. But after that night in April 1986, they never returned. We are in what was formerly a bedroom in this kindergarten, where children used to sleep and rest. Now there is a certain emptiness here. All these windows are broken, but the room continues to live on. Birds fly in here and sit on these bars. We even found the evidence that an owl comes here. An owl, it regurgitates food, fur, bones and feathers. Evidently, it likes to sit here on this window pane, so this room continues to maintain life. Even trees, which had proven especially vulnerable to radioactive fallout, are finding new homes in the evacuation zone. I'm sitting in the Pripyat soccer stadium where 20 years ago, hundreds of people would come and cheer on their favorite team. And you can imagine the laughter, the sounds of the crowds here. The activity on the field, which 20 years later is barely discernible. soccer field now is going through succession as you would expect and returning to what it was originally hundreds of years ago which was a mixed deciduous forest.
I grew up in a town about like this, and I used to enjoy riding bumper cars like these about a half a world away. And it seems pretty sad when you look now and you see what's become of this beautiful city of Pripyat and that people will never live here again. But there's another side to this story, a very encouraging side, one that says that life is much more resilient than what we thought possible, that in the absence of man, that life will continue and that life will thrive and that the legacy of life will always be here because we are a part of life. Even if we disappear, our legacy of life will continue. It's 25 years into a life after people. Out in the country, nature is beginning to erase all evidence of man. In the suburbs, packs of feral dogs roam through decaying neighborhoods in search of their next meal. In some of the great cities of the world, solid ground is getting harder to find. In the time of humans, London was protected from tidal surges by 10 retractable steel gates that could be raised during storms to seal off the Thames River from the North Sea. Without humans to operate the barrier, London is defenseless. Another low-lying city, Amsterdam, meets the same watery fate. In a New York City high-rise, some windows have already cracked and slipped loose from their frames and many more are on the verge of destruction. After a quarter century of exposure to moisture and heat without maintenance, the normally flexible window sealant has become rigid, locking this window to its frame. As the metal frame expands and contracts with changes in temperature, it induces stresses on the glass, which cracks and plummets to the sidewalk below. After a few of the windows fall out of a building like this, then the wind pressure effect changes dramatically. As well as external pressure coming onto the building, you also get suction, and that aggravates the problem, so more of the panels are likely to fall out. Through these gaping holes, the building fills with windswept debris. A summer storm rolls in. On top of the structure, the copper lightning deterrent system that once protected thousands of office workers is now corroded and useless. A lightning bolt turns the tower into a raging inferno. The gutted building makes the perfect home for a surprising survivor. Although pigeons once relied on the handouts of humans, they have done just fine in 25 years without us. Pigeons are survivors. They can live in the wild, they do live in the wild still. And in a period where there were no people, but there still were edifices and artifacts, our buildings, they would do very well because they would adopt these as kind of artificial cliff faces, which is what they really are adapted to. 
Like the pigeon, the disappearance of humans forced a change in the habits of the lowly cockroach. Think of the poor cockroach. After they gorge upon our surplus when we're gone, they'll mourn us. They'll be sorry. But the mourning won't last for long. While cockroaches thrived on our scraps, they can also eat book bindings and cardboard and any rotting organic matter, including dead leaves and roots. While food isn't a problem, roaches also need warmth, the kind that humans had always supplied through artificial heat. Cockroaches started as a tropical species, and some experts say they couldn't survive the winter in colder cities. But it's hard to bet against a creature that has seen the dinosaurs come and go. Cockroaches are extremely adaptable. They've been around for 300 million years. If I had to bet, I'd put my money on them being able to survive in one form or another. The first winter after humans did witness the die-off of some cockroaches. But many more moved underground to find warmth until milder temperatures returned. In an abandoned downtown, devoid of insecticides, overrun by vegetation, and with a rising water table, this former pest is now enjoying a golden age. Cockroaches were only a nuisance to humans. But wolves were a terror. So man hunted them mercilessly. When the first European settlers arrived in what is now the United States, it's believed nearly half a million wolves roamed the countryside. By the 20th century, these predators were nearly extinct in the lower 48 states. Now, with no humans left to battle them, wolf populations multiply by as much as six times each year. Within 25 years of our disappearance, there could easily be half a million of them roaming the United States again. This amazing comeback has been seen on a small scale before. In 1995, Biologists released a few dozen wolves within the boundaries of Yellowstone National Park, a place where they would be protected from persecution by humans. Within a decade, a few dozen had multiplied into 1,500 and the wolves quickly spread out from their release point to occupy territory throughout the states of Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. It'll be fast. And if you can start with just a few dozen wolves and in the course of one decade have a population of 1,500, and you can have a geographic expansion where they've filled up a big chunk of a three-state area, and these are big western states, yeah, when the conditions are right, they can recolonize pretty rapidly. Could we see them in Manhattan or Chicago? As soon as the deer get there, the wolves will be right behind them. Animals haven't just been hunted by humans, they've also been hemmed in. There are over three million miles of paved road in the United States alone. And it's no coincidence that many of them cut right through the paths animals use to get from place to place. The things that make a landscape good for animal movement also make it easy to engineer a road into that location. 